Uh, hi everyone, uh, this is Merrick Cabrera. I'm the uh, TA for this uh, course. Professor Shaban has allowed me to prepare this lecture and so today you'll be hearing from me. Um, I hope you all had a good Memorial Day weekend and are ready for our week four of this course and when we now discuss gender, sex, and sexuality. Um, just to introduce myself a little bit, um, I wanted to um, briefly tell you about me and also about my research and how in, it relates to, to this topic of this week. Um, I'm, again, my name is Merrick. I'm a native of Peru. I have lived in the United States for about 27 years now. It's been a long time. And um, I research um, youth violence, uh, adolescent violence, uh, to be more specific. Uh, in terms of the region, I concentrate on Central America, uh, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. The, uh, as you might uh, be aware, there is a, a major social uh, problem in, in those three countries in terms of gangs and the, the violence. Uh, these are the, some of the most violent countries in the world, and that's what I research in terms of uh, how, how to address it, how to think of it, and how to eventually uh, find a solution to it. So um, when, I, when I research uh, youth violence uh, in, in gangs, I also look at gender. Uh, it is very significant. It plays a big role. As you probably uh, guess, uh, most of gang members are, are males. And, but that does not mean that the gang phenomenon does not, have, does not affect uh, women. Uh, they are affected in, in a number of ways. Um, they are not only victims, but they're family members, girlfriends, they also belong to, to gangs. Some of them are leaders of, of, of gangs, very few, but there are. There's an estimated between five and 10% of most of gang members in Central America that are, that are um, women. Um, and just to uh, quickly give you an example of how this, uh, this is uh, significant, uh, uh, women, if they want to belong to a gang, they're given two options, uh, which is very different from a ma from from a male. A male, uh, men, um, they have to go through a severe beating to be accepted into the gang. Women are given two choices: they can go through the beating, or they can have sex with all the members of the gang, the local gang. You know, 15, 20, 25 men, which obviously is very traumatic. And, but um, that is one way that gender really plays a significant role in, in, in gangs, for example. I just wanted to, to, to illustrate that. I might come back to this topic in, during the lecture. Uh, and I will also, uh, to the extent possible, I will also relate some of my uh, understandings of my own uh, interpretations of my own society, Peru, uh, where I grew up and, and lived uh, in for about 16 years. I grew up and I was born there, and I left uh, Peru when I was 16 years old. Um, okay, this is the other uh, content of, our, of this presentation. We're going to talk about the definitions of the basic concepts. Uh, then we're going to uh, find ways of challenging these definitions and how they are binary in, in concept and how they shouldn't be. And we're going to look in history for examples of how these genders uh, have existed for a long time and also uh, sexes, uh, non-binary sexes in, in today's uh, world. And then we're going to dive a little bit uh, into how anthropology looks at normativity and the, the, the force it has in society, the normativity uh, in society, to shape the way we see the world. Uh, we're going to look at uh, this how this is constructed and how uh, these, nor the, these norms uh, also exist in, in the media in, in very um, pernicious ways, I should say. And then we're going to look at how those um, norms create a hierarchy and how they affect people in different ways. And in, in, in that uh, way, we're going to see masculinity and femini femininity and how they're regulated in society and how they affect, again, people differently, men and women. And then we're going to do a quick discussion of the reading materials and then the final key points. Um, so normativity. Uh, for, uh, 
in terms of the um, these two concepts, gender and sex. Well, uh, gender defines how a person expresses uh, himself, herself, themselves, actually, uh, and is understood to play a significant role in, in society, uh, with those roles and appearances being understood as that of a woman or of a man. Now, um, sex defines a person's biology, very different. So here we're talking about a particular set of, you know, the physicality of the human body, you know, set of organs and genes and hormones, and how they all have to match to make a female and a, and a male body. Um, as you can see here uh, in the graphic, uh, the dictionary uses, uh, in, in its definition of gender, at the bottom, it has, a, as a synonym, the word sex. And and it is exactly the same on the other one. Sex has, as, as a synonym, the word gender. So this is just one way of how, in society, we conflate the two sometimes, and which is uh, problematic, and we're going to see here why. Again, just to uh, quickly um, recap, um, gender is a socially determined uh, role for men and women. And sex is a biologically determined reproductive ability of a male or a female. Uh, this is this is important because we are going to um, try to shake up these these concepts in in, in this presentation. Um, let's look at this picture. Um, I, I got it from a previous presentation um, of the same topic. A boy, a boy or a girl. Uh, who can tell? It's it's very difficult. If I showed you this picture in black and white, uh, you, I mean, now you can use color to even kind of uh, guess, but uh, even then, can, can anyone tell the difference? It's very, very difficult. Um, so this is what we're going to unsettle in, in this conversation uh, today. But uh, it's still, it is very important to, to remember that in society, we are made to think in terms of both. Uh, just male, female, and a boy or girl, and that's that's it. There's nothing else, and uh, from a very early age, we're, we're, we are taught to think in those terms. So we're going to challenge this. Uh, this graphic, um, mm, what comes to mind is, you know, a restroom. And this has been, um, as many of you are aware, in the news lately, in the use of the restroom, um, in, in different parts of the country it has been made a federal uh, mandate now to allow uh, restrooms uh, to be used by people according to how, the, how they identify, identify themselves as opposed to how they were uh, biologically born. Uh, so yeah, this has been a significant debate and still is. And um, the idea is that the concept be complicated and uh, to show the diversity and the fluidity of, of, of genders in our society. One way of, of looking at this is to see how in the past uh, and how old these concepts are. These are no, not new concepts or these are not new uh, realities. So for example, let's uh, on the left of uh, this uh, slide, we can see um, a news piece that tells the story of how uh, a group of people in, in this case it's India, but uh, it was throughout uh, Asia that a group of people existed that were um, not one or the other gender. They were actually both, and they're called the Hishras. Uh, they for, they existed for millennia, and in in the last hundred years they were ostracized uh, after the uh, Western Empire uh, took over the, in this case, India, which is the, the British Empire. Uh, they outlawed these uh, genders and they made them criminals. Only recently, in the last couple of years, uh, the Su Supreme Court uh, ruling uh, allowed for these uh, new realities to you know be allowed again in legislation and be recognized and be brought back into society and so this is just one example of how old these these uh, realities are the second one is this, the picture on the right is a picture of a bardash which is uh, 
a Native American, in this case, uh, it, it could be a male female or a female male. They, they were known historically, and actually elders in these communities still still tell the stories of how uh, they have always existed and how they were uh, honored, and they were seen as two spirited persons. Uh, with uh, they were revered in in a number of ways. So, for example, you had males marrying uh, men marrying other men, and women. Uh, going into battle, for example, or marrying other uh, other women, and even though there there, there are uh, strict um, uh, restrictions in, in terms of gender in in a, lot, in a number of these uh, indigenous Native American societies, they nevertheless existed, and they were seen with uh, some special um, lens, I should say. So they were seen as I don't know maybe the third or the fourth gender, and they were not um, necessarily ostracized, quite the opposite in a number of ways. Um, so now, not not just let's bring it to, to, to today, but let, now let's look at uh, sexes, non-binary sexes. As we, as we saw in the, in the brief documentary of two people here in the U.S. Uh, who were violently uh, uh, how can I say this, altered when they were born because they did not conform to the typical uh, expectations that doctors had of what a boy or a girl is. So they were, operations were performed on them and their lives were ruined. So they were born intersex. I mean, let's just look at the, at the definition there. It's a general term used for a variety of conditions in which a person is born with a reproductive or sexual anatomy that doesn't seem to fit a typical definition of female or male. And so, again, how, how um, common is this? According to a researcher, um, as you can see the numbers there, one in 1,500 or one in 2,000 babies are born with noticeably atypical genitalia. And these people are made to, or were made, this less and less now, to suffer um, in their lives because of the decision by a doctor who had a clear idea of a binary idea of what a, a boy and a girl are supposed to be. So these are just numbers to illustrate how uh, the binary not only exists in terms of gender but also in terms of sex and even to this day. And now let's look at um, how anthropology looks at this issue cross-culturally and also uh, in time, in, in across time and space. Um, normativity is seen, we can see it in, in, in a lot of the spheres of our society, in education and advertising, as we will see later in the popular media, film, we see it everywhere. And there is, there is a strong effort, it seems, uh, for these normative uh, concepts to be instilled in society. So let's see how uh, anthropologists uh, see this. We take uh, the way people create meaning in the world as a social construction. In this case, gender and sex. Uh, we see how um, mm, these concepts are made in coordination with each other, how people come up with these concepts, and that's what we call it is a social construction. Anthropologists are, just to clarify, are looking at things at the level of the sh you know shared, common, dominant attitudes and behavior, and not so much uh, at the individual level. Um, we look at how people make meaning in terms of uh, rituals, as we saw last week, even though they may seem natural or universal to, to us, they're not. Uh, they're not set in stone, even though sometimes we act as if they are. The same thing applies to gender. And the idea of the, of the anthropologist is to complicate these uh, issues a little more because reality is more complicated than just binaries. Um, in, in terms of um, how we categorize in society, this is, this is important. Um, it's very easy to, see, to think... Uh, 
in terms of uh, binaries. And when we do that, we immediately create hierarchies. So let's look at those examples, pure and impure, uh, right and wrong, natural and unnatural, male, female, man and woman. When we, when we have these binaries, there is always a hierarchy. Even though uh, it's subtle, there is always a, a hierarchy. And this clearly also applies to, to the issues of, of gender. Um, anthropologists are not really interested in evaluating these norms and saying this is good, this is bad, this is better. No, no, no. That's, that's not the idea. Um, anthropologists are interested in understanding where these ideas come from and how they become popular and how they're perpetuated in society. That is, um, that is kind of the role of the anthropologist as an academic and a member of society. Now, in terms of, um, we're, we're going to come back to these questions. Uh, these are just three questions that I wanted to uh, bring up because they, um, they relate to something that is very important uh, in relation to hierarchies, power. How are gender, sex, and sexuality norms perpetuated? Who suffers as a consequence of, as a consequence of gender, sex, and sexuality norms? Does anyone benefit from their existence? And how? We're going to come back... Uh, to these, uh, how they're ranked and what it, what that really means. Um, in now we're going to dive into how these um, become or how they are reinforced in society. We learned these things uh, at a very young age. I don't have to explain this picture. It is clearly two toys: one for a boy, another the other one for a girl, a soldier and a Barbie, I guess. Um, we learn these things as, 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 uh, at a very young age. Different toys, different tastes, uh, different interests, and there are only two. That is, that is, that is very key. Um, just another dimension of, of this picture. Um, he, the soldier, is strong has the characteristics of, of, of power, um, whereas the, the, the Barbie is beautiful and it's fragile, and you could even say in, in need of protection. And these are characteristics that are, we, um, that are reflected upon these toys, but that also the toys reflect upon us as we grow up and as we adopt these uh, ideas of society and, and gender. Ads sell more than products. They sell values, they sell images, they sell concepts of love and sexual... Ads sell more than products. They sell values, they sell images, they sell concepts of love and sexuality, of success, and perhaps most important, of normalcy. To a great extent, they tell us who we are and who we should be. Well, what does advertising tell us about women? It tells us, as it always has, that what's most important is how we look. So the first thing the advertisers do is surround us with the image of ideal female beauty. Women learn from a very early age that we must spend enormous amounts of time, energy, and above all, money, striving to achieve this look and feeling ashamed and guilty when we fail. And failure is inevitable because the ideal is based on absolute flawlessness. She never has any lines or wrinkles. She certainly has no scars or blemishes. Indeed, she has no pores. And the most important aspect of this flawlessness is that it cannot be achieved. No one looks like this, including her. And this is the truth. No one looks like this. The supermodel Cindy Crawford once said, I wish I looked like Cindy Crawford. She doesn't. She couldn't, because this is a look that's been created for years through airbrushing and cosmetics, but these days it's done through the magic of computer retouching. Kira Knightley is given a bigger bust. Jessica Alba is made smaller. Kelly Clarkson. Well, this isn't interesting. It says, slim down your way, but she, in fact, slimmed down the Photoshop way. You almost never see a photograph of a woman considered beautiful that hasn't been Photoshopped. We all grow up in a culture in which women's bodies are constantly turned into things, into objects. Here she's become the bottle of Michelob. 
In this ad, she becomes part of a video game. And this is everywhere in all kinds of advertising. Women's bodies turn into things, into objects. Now, of course, this affects female self-esteem. It also does something even more insidious. It creates a climate in which there's widespread violence against women. I'm not at all saying that an ad like this directly causes violence. It's not that simple. But turning a human being into a thing is almost always the first step toward justifying violence against that person. We see this with racism. We see it with homophobia. We see it with terrorism. It's always the same process. The person is dehumanized, and violence then becomes inevitable. And that step is already and constantly taken with women. Women's bodies are dismembered in ads, hacked apart. Just one part of the body is focused upon, which, of course, is the most dehumanizing thing you could do to someone. Everywhere we look, women's bodies turned into things and often just parts of things. And girls are getting the message these days so young that they need to be impossibly beautiful, hot, sexy, extremely thin, and they also get the message that they're going to fail, that there's no way to really achieve it. Girls tend to feel fine about themselves when they're 8, 9, 10 years old, but they hit adolescence and they hit a wall. And certainly part of this wall is this terrible emphasis on physical perfection. So no wonder we have an epidemic of eating disorders in our country and increasingly throughout the world. I've been talking about this for a very long time, and I keep thinking that the models can't get any thinner, but they do. They get thinner and thinner and thinner. Um, I want to apologize for that uh, technical hiccup. Um, I wanted to explain uh, before we, um, we got to the video that um, this is one analysis of how the media, um, how the media works and how it operates in terms of, in, in a very subtle way, messages are sent to, in this case, uh, girls um, as they grow up and they begin to have perceptions of themselves. In, in very specific ways. Um, now, let's look at, um, again, how gender and hierarchy uh, intertwine. Uh, the question that we asked earlier is, uh, who wins and who loses? Just looking at these uh, statistics, just to name a few, 70% uh, of the world's poor are women. That is... Uh, that is uh, completely unacceptable, and the number is just gargant to one. Uh, here in the U.S., the number, uh, uh, for example, just to, uh, to, to talk about uh, uh, to talk about income, women make seventy percent, about seventy percent of what men make. Uh, that's just uh, another example uh, of of how gender plays out in society in, in a very material way, in how it, 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 these hierarchies manifest themselves. Another one here, 64% of illiterate adults are women. That's, that's in the world. That's two out of three women are illiterate. These are, these are numbers that clearly reflect a hierarchy and power dimensions that, uh, that, are, that derive from gender uh, binaries and gender concepts of hierarchy. Um, but again, the question of who wins and who loses is not as black and white as they may seem. Uh, masculinity uh, is also enforced in society, it becomes a straitjacket for, uh, for men. Just looking at this, uh, advertising is part of a campaign uh, that makes and sells weapons, for example, on the consumer market. And they, they, this was part of, of a series of, of advertisings that convey the message that men are supposed to be eating meat, and, you know, they support their local sports teams and refusing to take instructions from their wives, and they're all forms of, of being a man. Um, these are messages that are also sent to them, and there is a subtle message that also comes with, with that, is that if you fail, then your manliness is revoked. Your man card is revoked. You can see that graphic of, of the man you know, in tears, and because apparently he failed at being a, a, a man performing his role in society. 
So this idea of masculinity of being a man can also be very tyrannical on on men. One um, one example from my research is in, in Central America that men in the last 15, 20 years have been um, left out of this neoliberal uh, economic development where women are hired in much greater numbers, higher numbers than men, and so they become the breadwinners. And men are hurt in their masculinity, in the, in the way they're supposed to be uh, men in society. And of course, this is one aspect that, uh, to, a num to a certain extent, pushes men to become violent and to get involved in gangs. And that is an economic activity, basically. They make, they make money by being with gang members. They rob and extort people. So this is one way in which um, you know, the hierarchy also has a profound effect on, on men, uh, just, just like it, as it does uh, for women. Um, again, how this is uh, enforced uh, in, in the media, you know, masculinity and femininity, what I call this a tyranny. Um, on the left, you have a picture of a woman on the cover of a magazine and, and a man. She is uh, flirtatious, you know, pretty. The man is strong, muscular. Um, and not only that, you can see in this, um, in this graphic how he's not smiling, he's firm, he's looking into the distance. He knows what's going to happen in the future. He's a man uh, with foresight. She's not. Uh, she's shown as, you know, fragile and, like I said, flirtatious and pretty, but not displaying the, the, the masculine uh, characteristics that are um, associated with maleness, and you can see in the man on the right. Um, let's move on to the next one. And here I wanted to briefly touch upon some of the, uh, the readings, uh, the three readings, actually, the... the the key points of the, of the readings, The Gender of Brazilian Transgender Prostitutes um, by Kulik. This, is, this was quite an interesting reading, um, the, how sexuality and gender roles shape each other, but mostly how sexuality in Brazil, uh, in the community of uh, transgender, or what they call transvestite in Brazil, um, form their gender roles according to how they perform their sexuality in, in, in society. It is not as simple as just being a, a gay man, for example. A man having sex with another man, being the active uh, partner, does not necessarily make you a gay man in Brazil. In fact, it could be the opposite. Quite, an, quite interesting here. Um, and so you have this scenario of a third gender, not a man, um, but not really a woman, but wanting to have the characteristics of a woman for, for the transgender uh, male. So, um, the, so, so the key point here in, in this reading to me was that the, there was this convergence or maybe uh, how intertwined these two concepts are in uh, sexuality and gender uh, roles. Um, the second uh, article, Interpreting Gender and Sexuality, an uh, approach from cultural anthropology by Gottlieb. Um, this reading, um, I just wanted to basically uh, focus on the last part of the, of the article that highlights uh, something that uh, is central uh, for this lecture. It says, cultural anthropologists have long argued that both sex and gender have pow powerful cultural roots, making it difficult, perhaps impossible, to say where nature leaves off and culture begins. If anthropology can have any impact on our societies, we endeavor to create a more egalitarian, as we endeavor to create a more egalitarian set of opportunities for um, all people, regardless of gender. Perhaps it is through the realization that gender arrangements and sexual practices alike have an outstanding variability as we look around the globe, reminding us that no pattern, however much it may appear to be natural, is 
inevitable. This takes us back to this idea that a binary, the straitjacket of a binary has to be unsettled and made more complicated. That there is not two genders that people usually fall uh, within a range or a spectrum of, of gender where they can play with their sexuality, with their gender, um, with their sex. It's, it is much more, much more complicated again. And the last uh, reading I uh, wanted to hi highlight, which is, to me, was fascinating. This is the first time I, I encountered it. It's the egg and the sperm, how science has constructed uh, a romance uh, based on the stereotypical male-female roles. Um, the interesting thing here is that it, 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 these are scientists who, who come up with these ways of looking at you know, uh, the sperm and the egg and how they they are portraying onto these very, very tiny cells. They're, por they're portraying their own ideologies, their own concepts of society. They're, these tiny cells have, in the scientists' views, uh, a personality which is very ideological, based on, on, on the scientist's uh, social views and the ideological views that inform his society are portrayed or are projected onto, these, um, onto his findings. This is very key. Sometimes here, uh, especially uh, in Western societies, science is seen as, as being pure, very factual, and there is no way to to counter that, or it, it is just a fact. And this article was very powerful in that it showed that it's that that's not always the case. That ideology uh, has a very profound way of shaping even scientists, or maybe I should say, especially scientists, in their understanding of the world and how they present it to us. The um, the first quote, or the quote there, the man is an animal suspended in webs of significance. He himself has spun IT culture to be those webs. That's an influential um, anthropologist, Clifford Geertz. In, back in the 1970s, he explains how men, scientists are usually men, uh, also project their own views onto their work. Uh, those two lines at the bottom, science, like religion, is embedded in or intertwined with culture. Scientific fact is informed by cultural norms, as we clearly read in the article. And scientists are always looking at the world from within a cultural context, not from without, not from, from the outside. They're not able to do that. They do not have the ability to step outside of it to an, advent, to an objective vantage point. Um, and that is it. And if I want, if, if I could add one final uh, key point, is that, or a final takeaway, is that in our society, in just a, in, like in other societies, these very simple concepts have very profound effects um, that are sometimes difficult to untangle and to see how they not only reproduce themselves. Or perpetuate themselves, but also in the effects they have. Uh, it is very easy to just fall into the trap. So this is natural, and that is not natural. Why don't we just conform to the, to to what um, nature tells us? But clearly, in history and in, in in today's world, we see that that things are not that simple. Things are much more complicated, and we have men who feel that they are not necessarily men according to how they feel, how they want to be perceived, and the same with women. And there are, there are alternatives, and there are, there's a range of, of uh, possibilities for them in, in anthropology. And anthropology plays a role in uncovering or entangling these uh, ideological positions and showing what they really are. Well, that's it uh, for this uh, lecture.
Um, yeah, I'm sure you have already done the readings, or you will soon. But um, these are um, this is just a, a, re a quick review of them. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to email me. You have my email. Uh, it's m as my, my first initial m c zero nine four nine letter a at student.american.edu. Uh, you can uh, every Wednesday from seven to nine. I um, available on Skype and you have my username, it's my first name and my last name, Merrick Cabrera. You can find me there. You know, if you cannot do it at that time, we can always find a different way or a different time to do it. Feel free to email me with, with any questions or about this specific lecture or with anything related to, to this week's readings or course. Uh, I hope you have a good rest of the week and I look forward to reading your uh, questions and your responses. Uh, thanks.